Nine out of 10 Americans are deficient in potassium. Nine out of 10, dude. Yeah, that's insane. That's, it, that is insane, bro. 90% of Americans deficient in potassium, okay? Seven out of 10, so 70% deficient in, in calcium. 80% deficient in vitamin E. 50% of Americans def deficient in vitamin A, vitamin C, and magnesium. Bro. Oi. It's Idiot Squared. Welcome back for another episode. Uh, this week, we're going to be discussing essential nutrition. Uh, what is essential? What is not essential? Uh, what do we currently know and why are the things uh, essential and non-essential? Like, what do they do in the body? Why is it that we need to ingest these things from our food sources or dietary intake um, to thrive and to maintain our processes over time? Uh, we're going to deep dive into that. Uh, we're going to also discuss why the USDA doesn't track some essential nutrients. Like Their whole job is to record nutritional information for foods, but why do they not track some of the essentials? I don't know. But it is strange that they don't have that data available, considering these things are essential. Anyway, uh, we're going to deep dive straight into it. Polska, how are you this week? I'm good, bro. How are you? Also fantastic. Thanks for asking. Um, okay, so uh, have you got a good understanding, you think, of what's essential and what is non-essential? I, I did. I used to. Look, I don't know about that anymore. I guess we're going to find out, guy. I mean, we did discuss... Sorry, sorry. I did, we did discuss recently how carbohydrates are not essential. I thought that was an interesting uh, discussion. So if you guys didn't check out that podcast, go look for that one. We did that like maybe a month ago, five weeks ago. Yeah. So dietary carbs aren't, um, aren't es essential in the sense that we can, if we just eat protein and fat, we can uh, produce carbohydrates within the body. And that can be enough to, to run whatever processes might be needing those carbohydrates. But essentially, yeah, dietary carbohydrates are considered non-essential uh, because we can, we can convert fat and we can convert, oh, sorry, yeah, we can convert protein by our gluconeogenesis uh, into carbs in the body if we need it. Um, doesn't mean that dietary carbohydrates aren't useful and can't be used to um, enhance performance and fuel activity and all those different things. But anyway. Uh, I digress. So let's get into it. Um, so there's many levels, right? So we can think at, at the at the top, the highest of the high levels, we have calories, right? That's um, essentially the unit of measurement for en the energy of food or how much energy is contained in the food. And we require energy to run. Um, our metabolism uh, takes in food, it breaks it down and utilizes the components of that food, but also the energy in that food to to fuel the processes that make us us or make life life. Okay, so um, that's at the top level. We have calories. The next level down from that, the next the next um, finer graining, still a coarse graining, but it's it's another level down. We have what are considered to be the macronutrients. Right, so you would be well versed in the the main macros: proteins, fats. And those scrumptious carbs, dude. Fucking yep. love carbs, bro. God damn. <laughs> uh, okay, so yes, definitely. They are the three main ones. Um, we also have uh, alcohol. Fiber is sometimes considered a macronutrient. And the big one that is often not really talked about is water. Water is also like a macronutrient, right? Um, doesn't necessarily provide any caloric value, but it is essential. Um, yeah, over sixty percent of the human body is um, made up of water, right? So we we need water. So um, in the context of this conversation, we'll we'll just be focusing mainly on the uh, protein, fats, and carbs because they're the the three main ones that that most people sort of track, right? So uh, they're the essential at that level. And what you'll notice is at at, at, at each level as we go down. We get more and more things. So it branches. Um, we've done this whole Wolfram physics stuff, the games and all those different things. Um, we, we know about the branching and merging. So this is why for a lot of people, um, they might just pick calories to worry about, right? Because calories is just one thing, very easy. You can just sink, very simple to keep track of. Then you go to macros and now you got three things to keep track of. Whoa, man, three things could be overwhelming. Uh, but then once you go down deeper, we start to get many, many threads. So there's many, many threads to keep track of. So um, as we go down, we then get into the uh, 
so we can break each of those macros down into um, components. So within protein, there are essential amino acids that we need to keep track of or need to keep track of, but we need to ingest to, to maintain um, the processes in our body. And uh, if you have deficiencies in some of these, uh, it can lead to health problems. It can lead to a lack of energy. It can lead to disease, essentially, right? Welcome to Good Meals. I'm Ruben. I'm the founder and developer of Good Meals, and I'm here to introduce you to a smarter way to approach your diet. Forget the one-size-fits-all meal plans. Good Meals is about precision, personalization, and simplicity. It's not just a meal planner. It's a tool that adapts to you. Start by telling us about yourself. Your goals are unique. So should be your meal plan. Good Meals utilizes advanced AI to tailor every meal to your specific nutritional needs. Here's where it gets interesting. Our extensive database isn't just a collection of recipes, it's a culinary exploration. Whether you have specific dietary preferences or just what's available in your fridge, Good Meals finds the perfect recipe for you. And it's not just about variety. We focus on the nutritional value, ensuring that every bite takes you closer to your health goals. Join Good Meals today at goodmeals.health. It's not just about eating better, it's about revolutionizing the way you think about food. Because at Good Meals, every meal is a step towards a healthier, happier you. I'm not sure if you mentioned it. Did you already mention why there, like why there's essential nutrients and why there's not essential? Did you already mention? Oh, no, but uh, I sort of just uh, assumed, which is silly of me. So um, why are there essential and not essential things? So what, what makes something essential? Well, what makes something essential is that it cannot be synthesized by our bodies, right? So uh, vitamin C is a very common one, right? Uh, people know it because of scurvy and things like that. But we can't synthesize vitamin C in our biology, right? Our bodies don't make vitamin C, okay? So we need to get it from our diet or lifestyle, right? We need to ingest that because we can't make it. So that's what makes something essential is that if we can't make it in the body, um, that it becomes essential. We need to get it from outside sources, right? We need to get it from our environment. Um, and so this, this is, this is why. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's essentially what makes something essential. Um, non-essential things are things that can be synthesized by the body, but might still be beneficial to ingest, right? So that could be carbohydrates, fiber, antioxidants, and polyphenols, as well as flavonoids and other compounds, right? Those things, uh, some of them, you know, can be synthesized by the body, but it can, could, it can be helpful to get extra levels of those. Or if you do certain activities, you might deplete them at a faster rate, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So um, I'm going to screen share just quickly. Um, cause it's going to be a little bit easier for everyone to track and I can sort of, um, go through this food and nutrition. What is food? Um, food is a substance consumed for nutritional support and energy. Uh, it can be of plant, animal, fungal, or microbial sources, uh, essential nutrients. So we have water, proteins, fats, vitamins, and minerals, All right? These are all essential where these are things that we need to ingest from the environment or our foods. Uh, and then we have the phases of nourishment, right? So this is um, something that is often overlooked. But uh, firstly, with this all this essential stuff, you, you, you first and foremost have to ingest the thing, right? So you have to put it in your mouth or in your body, right? Uh, then, then you have to digest that thing. So you, what, what we do with our digestion is we ingest like large scale things that are made up of lots of different things. You know, we talk about this, no one thing is, um, no thing is just one thing. It's made up of lots of different things. So the, the process of digestion is breaking these, these large scale things down into littler or the constituent parts, right? Then we have absorption, which is where the, uh, the nutrition goes down into our gut or the food goes down into our gut and it diffuses into our bloodstream through the, um, gastrointestinal tract or the, the, um, your, what is it? the walls, right? It, it diffuses through the, the walls of your intestine. Okay. Then, um, it gets into the bloodstream, right? So now it's technically it's in your body, right? Up until this point, it hasn't been in your body. It's been outside your body because inside of your mouth is actually outside of your body. Um, 
Then we have assimilation. Okay. So this is where the cells and the organs and the different uh, things that make you up as your body uh, or, or make up your body, sorry, um, assimilate that nutrition, right? So they pull that nutrition from the bloodstream into the, the cells or, or, or the processes that require that nutrition, okay? Or those essential um, vitamins, minerals, proteins, fats, or amino acids, right? Okay, so then um, on this thing, I've got the essential versus non-essential. We just covered this. So it cannot be synthesized. Something is essential if it cannot be synthesized by the body. And, and, and I would add to that also, it contributes to some vital process, right? It contributes to some uh, process within your body that needs it to, to continue doing that process. Non-essential are things that can be synthesized by the body, but m- may still be beneficial. And we covered that, right? So we've done the, the calories. We've done the macronutrients. So we know that there's protein, fat, and carbs. Um, now they're important because they're responsible for growth, repair, and maintenance. And they also build the structures of our body, right? Um, so there are nine essential amino acids, nine, and, um, these are, again, things that we need to ingest in order to have the adequate levels of these things. Now, if you're deficient in some of these things, if, um, for example, tryptophan, right? So tryptophan is responsible, uh, is part of, well, tryptophan is part of the cycle that produces melatonin in the body, right? Uh, melatonin can help with sleep, um, do a bunch of other things, antioxidant, et cetera. So if you don't have the necessary tryptophan, you then can't complete that melatonin cycle or you can't complete the synthesis of the melatonin to the, to the level that you otherwise would have been able to if you had adequate levels of this thing. So if you're deficient in some of these um, amino acids, the processes or the structures that need these things can't complete what they should be doing. So this can leave you uh, vulnerable. And this can be the start of dis-ease, right? This can, this is, I, I, I'm going to hypothesize that this is a, a big contributor to, to a large portion of disease, right? Is that we are actually undernourished um, broadly, okay? Not every single person, but broadly. So yeah, nine essential amino acids. We'll dive into each of those uh, a little bit. Uh, with actually, fats, you go. Sorry, I, I actually just remember that. I brought something up when we were just before the pod, actually. Uh, and it goes in hand with what you were just saying, how um, sometimes a large portion of the population is not nourishing themselves properly, right? You sort of just mentioned, alluded to that. Yeah. And uh, I, I found this stat and I thought it was a very interesting stat, but it's a stat taken from America. So it's likely this would be similar in most places just because I feel like most places are just westernized at, at this point, but it is it, it did come out of America. So nine out of 10 Americans are deficient in potassium. Nine out of 10, dude. Yeah, that's insane. That's it, that is insane, bro. 90% of Americans deficient yeah. in potassium, okay? Seven out of 10, so 70% deficient in, in calcium. 80% deficient in vitamin E. 50% of Americans def- deficient in vitamin A, vitamin C, and magnesium. Bro. Yeah. <laughs> like Okay. And I, okay, so this you did this is a brilliant point, right? Okay. So the real reason that we I wanted to do this and we decided to do this part is because it we know that there are essential things, right? Like we do, like there is human knowledge that states that there are essential things that we need to ingest in order to, you know, be fully functioning, right? To function um, at the, you know, to complete the essential processes in our body, right? At the bare minimum. How is this not common knowledge? Why are we eating to nourish? Why are we like, how can you have nine out of 10 Americans deficient in potassium, right? Potassium isn't expensive. It's not like it's not available. It's, It's pretty easy to get if you start to, if you understand foods. And on top of that, right, the, the real reason we, we did the, decided to do the pod is because the USDA doesn't even track all of the essential nutrients. So the USDA is responsible for, provo- uh, for testing foods and to assess the nutritional values of each of the foods, right? So they look at what's in food, like what, nu- what, nu- what are the compounds in food and what nutrition is in food, but they don't track a good portion of the essential nutrients. Like they don't even have data 
on how much of those essential nutrients are in the food. Okay, are right, we uncovering so a cons conspiracy? Or are we going to be uncovering a conspiracy? I don't know if it's today? a conspiracy. I'm just going to assume ignorance. But yeah, um, yeah so I, I've got some spreadsheets that we'll go over in a minute. Um, it's going to be interesting to see which ones. Sorry yeah, to cut you right? off. It would be interesting to see which ones they're they're not showing and try and dive deeper to see why it could be, what the conspiracy could be. What if they've chosen specific ones that are super important for certain things and they just decide, well, we're just not going to track those ones because uh, if we do, people are going to be way too healthy and we need people to be sick. Yeah, I love how your conspiracy mind goes there. Um <laughs> I don't know if it's going to be that, <laughs> but yes, definitely. It's going to be interesting, right? Um, so I, I, I already know because I already looked at this. It, it, it's interesting. Um, so one, they do track potassium, right? So this, it seems stupid that nine out of 10 people in America are deficient in potassium. Like that is just such a simple fix, right? Like, uh, and, and it's crazy, right? It can have such an impact on um, blood pressure, uh, energy levels, your metabolism, sleep quality, um, cognitive function, like potassium is so important. Potassium is, is largely an intracellular hydrator. It helps to pull uh, fluid water into the cells to hydrate the, the, the inside of the cell. Not only that is you have like sodium potassium pumps on all of your cells that, um, that, that influence the pros, like the, the interaction of cells within your body. Like what can they, um, what can they bring into them? What can they put out of them? The, the electrical potential, right? That the spark that is life kind of thing. Um, the sodium potassium pumps are involved in that. Like this, it's just bonkers, right? That nine out of 10 are. Um, I think you should, you should start the pod with that bit, dude. That was mad, um, mad good, uh, hit points. Okay. Like that should, that should be the opening clip. All right. All right. That was way better than my oi intro. Uh, so anyway, we're going to keep going. Negative. All right. All right. Uh, okay. So we know, okay. So there's the essential amino acids, right? Uh, amino acids make proteins. Okay. Then we have fats, right? So fats are an energy source. They are also, um, provide the, the building blocks for the cell membranes. Okay. And there are two essential fatty acids at that, that high level, which is omega-3 alpha linoleic acid and omega-6 linoleic acid, right? They're the two essential fatty acids. Um, that our bodies can't make. Okay. So that's why they're essential. So we need to eat these. Now, uh, interesting to the note thing to note here is, uh, the omega three and omega six. Um, so historically it is said that we had a, a much closer ratio of omega three to omega six. Like it was more like a, a more like a one-to-one -one sort of vibe. Um, it, it wasn't one-to-one, -one, but closer to that. Right. And now in modern times, we actually consume significantly more omega-6s than we do omega-3s. So the omega-3 to 6 ratio is skewed so that we, um, in the modern, in modern times, the average person is consuming um, more omega-6s relative to what we historically have. And also the, that ratio of omega-3 to 6 has now been skewed in favor of omega-6s, Okay. So omega-6s can be associated with pro-inflammatory things, et cetera. Now, they're still essential, right? But the amount that we're consuming, it's like we, we might be over-consuming one of these essentials and under-consuming the other. That's still going to be a problem, right? Um, so just to clarify what you're saying, bro, you're saying that the recommendations have been altered now or our bodies have adapted to being able to consume a larger ratio of omega-6? No, I, oh, I don't think that, well, maybe some bodies have adapted. Um, no, I don't think the recommendations have changed. It's just a product of the, the way that modern food is, right? We just consume more foods that have omega-6 in them than omega-3. Yeah. Okay, right? I see so what you're saying, yeah. when you're consuming corn and seed oils and all of these other things, they're going to be high in omega-6 and not as high in omega-3. Um, and so it's the, the ratio is messed up, right? So, um, most people don't, would just need to, yeah, most people would just need to increase their consumption of omega-3 and they would see like an improvement and, and possibly decrease some of their consumption of omega-6 to try and get that ratio back to what it should be. We'll go over what that ratio, um, is, is said to, is said it should be, right? The, the guidelines for that ratio. Um, but yeah. In the modern world, in the Western, in the modern American diet, people are consuming significantly more omega-6s 
than we historically have. And we're not consuming as, as many omega-3s. Okay. So, um, then we've got the carbs, right? Primary energy source, simple and complex forms, bunch of carb things. Now we get into the micronutrients, right? So this is, uh, the vitamins essentially. Okay. So there are 13 essential vitamins that we need to ingest, right? As humans, four of those are fat soluble vitamins, right? Uh, vitamin A. You mentioned that there was a deficiency. So vitamin A, vitamin D, right? Which is not something that we need to necessarily ingest, right? From our diet. It's actually something that we get from sun exposure. So when you go out into the sun and you expose your skin to the, the photons that are being produced by the sun, you essentially are converting cholesterol um, in your bloodstream into vitamin D. And on top of that, your body will be producing, or your skin will be producing nitric oxide, which uh, can lower blood pressure, increase blood flow to the peripheral, um, a whole host of other benefits from getting sun exposure. Ideally, when you're doing this, though, you're not doing it in the middle of the day or when you when the, the sun is directly overhead, because that's when it's uh, dangerous, unless you have high levels of melanin in your skin. Um, but yeah, so vitamin D, can, we can largely get from the sun. Uh, and if you live somewhere where you don't have a lot of uh, daylight or, or, you know, it's not sunny or there's not a lot of light outside, you have short days, so to speak, then you can supplement with it. And things like cod liver oil and other supplements can be a good dietary source of vitamin D. Okay. Vitamin E and vitamin K are also fat soluble vitamins, right? So we get them from things uh, that have higher contents of fat, right? That's how they're transported in the body. So if you're eating a, a, a no fat diet, that means that you, you, you're essentially missing out on at the very least three of these fat soluble vitamins and possibly not even able to synthesize the vitamin D uh, from, from the sunlight exposure. Okay. Then we have water soluble vitamins and there are nine of these nine water soluble vitamins and they're largely the B vitamins and vitamin C, right? So we have B1, B2, B3, B5, B6, B7, B9, and B12 are all essential. We need to get these. And vitamin C, uh, ascorbic acid, and ascorbates, okay? So anything on that? Any questions? I know, just, just a, a, ta um, a comment, actually. There was, I remember like, do you remember this back in the day where there was these uh, bullshit studies coming out about, I, I don't remember if they coined it as vitamin b13 or something but they were claiming that there's a there's this b vitamin that you can find in apple seeds that can fight cancer and fight diseases did you ever hear about this no that's fascinating it, it fucking blew up dude like it was it was huge like people that didn't even study nutrition were would would talk to me about it oh have you heard have you heard about this new vitamin that's in that's been found in apple seeds so, so that was like the claim that you should eat the entire apple, including the apple seeds, because the apple seeds have this special, I believe they said it was B13 and apparently yeah. it's supposed to fight against certain diseases and or uh, cancer. And then, um, what happened was people were saying, yo, be careful not to eat too many apple seeds because apple seeds as well contain, I believe it's called arsenic. Yes. Arsenic. I think. Yeah. So <laughs> also known to be highly toxic to humans. Yeah. Yeah. So in large so it doses, was, it was just funny because it was like just blowing up about, yeah, but it was just all, you know, you know how the nutrition world is, dude. It's, it's, it's so scammy. Well, definitely. Even at the highest definitely. level. So it's just, it's just hilarious. That is interesting. You know, I'd never heard about that. Um, but that, I'll have to have a look at it now. Um, so yeah, they're the nine essential, um, water soluble micronutrients. Okay. So we've gone from calories to macronutrients to now micronutrients. And we're going to go another layer deeper, right? So we have minerals as well that are essential to the human body, right? To sustain us in life. And so we can break those down into two classes. So we have macro minerals, they're the, the larger ones, the ones that we require in larger amounts as well. And then we have trace minerals, also commonly referred to as micro minerals. Okay. So we've got this, this breaking down. So there are five macro minerals that we need to consume. They are calcium, phosphorus, 
potassium, sodium, and magnesium. Okay. So, um, yeah, five macro minerals that need to be consumed in, in decent quanti quantities to, um, complete the essential processes. So like one thing with meta uh, magnesium, magnesium is, you know, essential, but on top of that, it's involved in at the very least 400 metabolic processes, right? So if you are deficient in magnesium, well, then there's a good chunk, if not all of those processes that, that can't complete because they don't have one of the ingredients or one of the uh, essential components of completing that process. So this By is the why way, yeah, efficiencies but, are, are crazy, but yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Um, with magnesium, I was looking at something recently and there's actually a lot of different forms of magnesium. Well, actually there's a lot of different forms of each of these micronutrients or even the micro, sorry, the macro mineral nutrients or however the uh, proper macro nomenclature would be. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's like an L form, there's, there's some other forms, but, but basically you have to, what you have to do your research and know which, if you're going to, if you're going to supplement that is, you have to buy the right one because if you buy the wrong one, it's likely that it's not being absorbed well and it's not getting to where it actually needs to be to carry out its function. So you have to be very careful when you're buying these supplements. And I can't remember, there's a few forms of magnesium that work, but not all of them. Do you, do you remember offhand which ones yes. they are? Uh, well, not, no, I'm currently putting together a map of all of these things. So what I want to do is provide one of those like, um, multi-way graphs essentially, um, to show how each of these things break down into the constituent parts. Like you mentioned, there's many different versions of all these things, right? So vitamin K, you've got polyquinone, polyquinones, menaquinones, menadiones, and you've got all these different versions, right? There's so many different factors. Um, you've got for vitamin E, you've got tocopherols and tocophotrienols and then you've got alpha tocopherols beta tocopherols or all these different versions so each of each of these things is just a oh, no but there are many different versions of it like you mentioned so with magnesium you have like there's the magnesium theonate you've got magnesium glycinate you've got magnesium shellate you've got magnesium uh you got there's so many different versions and you're exactly right some of them are more bioavailable than others. So this is where that um, digestion, ingestion, absorption, and assimilation. So some of these things can't be absorbed as easily as others, and then other forms can't be assimilated as easy as others. Um, so yes, it is very important. Uh, I will be, like I said, I will be producing a map of all of these things. So that's one of my goals with doing all this stuff on nutrition is to actually map it out because it's actually incredibly difficult right now to find any of this stuff and to find like, what can I eat to actually hit my um, essential nutrient goals, right? Like, we know that there are levels of these things that are, are essentially a bare minimum for people. So why is it so hard to figure out how to satisfy that bare minimum, right? Like, it shouldn't be that hard. And there also needs to be, you know, easy to understand um, versions of like, okay, what forms of these things should I try consuming? Ideally, you're getting them from nature, right? So whenever you eat sardines or salmon or certain vegetables, you're going to, and other meats, obviously as well as eggs and things like that, you're going to be getting a bunch of these different um, vitamins, minerals, uh, and, and, and trace minerals as well in those foods. Uh, and typically, they're going to be the most sort of bioavailable sources, right? They're going to be the easiest for your body to assimilate into itself. But yeah, um, there's a shit ton of magnesiums, dude. Uh, and, and, and same for all of these, these versions, right? So um, yeah, we, we'll, I'll produce that map and we'll make it, make it available for everybody. So um, the next level down are these trace minerals, right? So trace minerals uh, are still important, but we just don't need them in the same quantities, right? So typically you were needing like milligrams or grams of these macro minerals. And with these trace minerals, we're needing like, um, you know, micrograms. Okay. So tiny, tiny little amounts. So there's nine of those and they are iron, chloride, cobalt, copper, zinc, manganese, molybdenum, iodine and selenium molybdenum i've never even heard of that one okay i'll get what, it out for you what the hell that's the first time and i thought i studied nutrition guy look at this that's the first well, time i've seen that what i'm trying to communicate is 
so much of this stuff is known, but it's not necessarily taught and it's not wow. necessarily discussed regularly, is it? Like, yeah, you've studied nutrition, but you probably didn't learn about Molly Bendham and why well, is it I've never important? even heard of it. Never even heard of it, bro. That's crazy. Huh. Okay. So I'm just getting a, a page up here. Like, damn, like I've looked at so much nutritional data in my life and I've never even seen it on, on any, that's, that's interesting. It's also possible that I just overlooked it. You know, I'm, I'm bad for that. You so, know, you, uh, yeah. So, um, again, Molly Bendham is essential for the, for the human. We don't need you know, huge amounts of it, but we do need some to, to play a critical role. Uh, it says it's typically found in beans, lentils, grains, and organ meats, particularly the liver and kidney. Um, poorer sources include animal, uh, other animal products, fruits, and many vegetables. Uh, your body doesn't, uh, studies have shown that your body doesn't absorb it well from f certain foods, particularly soy products, which contain 57 to 58% molybendum bioavailability. Uh, however, this is not considered a problem, et cetera. So, um, different food sources will be more bioavailable than others, right? Um, so molybendum acts as a cofactor for four enzymes. These enzymes are involved in processing sulfites and breaking down waste products and toxins in your body. So essentially molybendum, you know, is essential in part of your detoxification pathways, right? And so imagine if you're deficient in that, you can't be breaking these things down. And, um, specifically like the sulfites, um, can lead to problems if they accumulate within your body. Um, so very few people are deficient, right? So very few people are deficient in molybendum. Uh, essentially we don't need a huge amount, so it's quite easy to hit the RDAs. Um, but is molybendum or is it the other one is it's a metal, I believe. The liver is such an excellent source of nutrients. Eh? That's crazy. Too bad. Oh, it just okay. Like liver just King. Too. Okay. Liver King. <laughs> Hey, that guy's still around, eh? Yeah, yeah. But He's yeah, still doing it apparently. No, that's it. It's just it's just amazing how how many nutrients you can get from eating liver, but it just tastes for like just horrible, dude. I hate liver. It's so gross. But it's something you just gotta eat. There are ways. Um, so one thing I found because um, I I do consume a, a, a decent amount of liver um, because of the nutritional value of it, right? Um, is over time, you definitely, you develop taste buds for it. So you learn to really enjoy it and love it. Um, so what I started doing was, uh, actually made a product called good burgers, um, where I combined a bunch of organ meats with muscle meat to make burger patties. And so I did that by like combining, you know, like, uh, you get your brisket and your chuck. Uh, you mince that up and then you have like a small percentage of liver, kidney and heart that you add into that mix, right? To get, cause again, those, those organs are rich in certain, um, nutrients and, um, you know, yeah, nutrients. Uh, and then I would add in certain herbs as well as salt to uh, augment the flavor and also provide more nutrition. So a really good addition to like organ, organ products is, um, shit, why am I blanking, is oregano. Um, so uh, typically used in like um, Italian cooking. I love the flavor, but uh, I got it to the recipe. So I got it to the point where like you, you couldn't taste that there was liver in the, the, the burgers. They just tasted like the most delicious burger you'd ever had. Um, nice. Yeah, and famously like uh, McDonald's and places like that used to use uh, organs and, and heart and stuff in their burger patties because it was cheaper. Right? Yeah. Uh, and they, were, they were, and they would have been really tasty back then, but since then they've gone for that like lower nutrient density uh, to get the people overeating in a sense. Yeah. So yeah, um, there's ways to do it. You got to sort of hack the system, but um, you don't nap like you develop taste buds for certain things. So there's a, a really sure. interesting study that was done with like, well, there's two actually. The first one I'm going to mention is hilarious, right? They found like how do you get kids to eat more vegetables was was like the premise of this study, right? And they found that the best way to get kids to eat more vegetables was to tell them that it came from McDonald's. <laughs> right? that, that's one. Okay. How stupid yeah. is that? But it works. The yeah. second way is to just slowly start to blend up like small amounts of vegetables and add it to their food. So like add it to sauces, 
you know, like, so if you're making like a pasta or something, just blend up a little bit of vegetables and, and mix it through the sauce so that they don't even know that there's vegetables in there. And gradually over time, they start to develop taste buds, right? Or you start to, you know, you're fine tuning your taste buds to sort of uh, appreciate those flavors and then they can eat the vegetables without a problem. But you can do the same thing with the organ meats. Yeah, that, yeah, that, it does work actually. You're right. It would be mad funny to be a part of that meeting, eh? Where they came up with that. Well, let's yeah. just tell the kids that it's from McDonald's. It, it must have been like some, I don't know, some like master's or PhD student saying it maybe as a joke at first. Who knows? But it just would have been so funny if somebody like, yo, hold on a second. That's actually a good idea. If we tell them it's from McDonald's, and it's funny that it works. It makes sense. It yeah. probably would have worked on me when I was a kid. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Definitely. No, it's mad funny. I, love that. Uh, I just thought that that was like such a hilarious hack. hack. Like uh, McDonald's has done such a good job with their marketing and like brand association and all that stuff that like you can literally use it to help kids to get eat more vegetables just by telling them it comes from Mac. Yeah, that's Mac. mad it's like, funny. Imagine yeah, if McDonald's suddenly started promoting broccoli or something. Right. Salads to kids. Could you imagine? The power McDonald's has over children is incredible. Definitely. Like, uh, and it's been like, that way for years. Like when, when for we a were long kids. Time. Yeah, bro, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah. So um, we have an, uh, there's a new sort of food startup in Australia called Oliver's. And they're like sort of doing the fast food kind of vibe, but healthy, right? So their thing is they don't have, they don't have French fries. They have, you can buy packets of green beans, like, and they put them in the same chip packet kind of vibe for their advertising, but it's green beans instead. Um, so they're going for that. I don't know how successful they've been. I, I must admit, I haven't seen one in the last couple of months, uh, or actually, no, sorry. Yeah. The last couple of weeks being on the road. Um, so yeah, maybe they're not going so well, but yeah, all of us, they were trying, they were trying to do the new, they were trying to sort of a healthy McDonald's kind of vibe, if that makes sense. Well, then, um, um, okay. So there is one other element on there that I think that you're probably not going to be familiar with, which is manganese. Th that one I've actually heard of. That okay. one I've actually heard of, yeah. So that's the metal. That was the one I was talking about with the metal. So the oh, funny okay. thing about this manganese, right, is you could, like if you were to just eat the manganese metal, right, pure manganese, you couldn't absorb it. You have to you have to ingest it in a in a in a in a form um, that your body can digest and absorb, right? And that isn't the the chemical element form. That isn't the pure form, the metal. That's uh, it's actually through other foods, right, other sources. So yeah, it's inter it's it's important to understand um, how to get these things into your diet and and the ways that are efficient and practical, right? Uh, okay, so the real reason we uh, wanted to do this is to look at why the USDA doesn't track some nutrition, right? Like some of we know that there's essential stuff. We've just gone over all of those things. We've, we've got huge amounts of um, science that's been done on this, right? There's a lot of 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 useful information about why these things are um, essential and the different process that they're involved in. But why would the USDA not track all of the essential nutrients, right? Um, like it just, it, it baffles me, right? So for comparison, I've got um, an Australian food database, or a database of Australian foods, right? And this is the, you know, not the nutritional board, but the Agricultural Board of Australia, um, do the nutrient analysis on this, right? So they track, wait for it, all of these different nutrients, okay? So we've got like the, the names of the foods and all that kind of stuff, right? Then we've got the, the energy. So that's like your, your calories, okay? Uh, although we track it in kilojoules, which is I don't know, annoying, but whatever. Uh, we track the water. So these things are important, right? Then you got the protein, the nitrogen, um, the fat. We, we track the ash levels, um, Actually. dietary fiber, alcohol, fructose, glucose, sucrose. So these are all different types of sugars, carbohydrates, right? Then we track the total sugars, um, added sugars, free sugars. We track the starches, dextrin, glycerol, which is uh, sugar alcohol, glycogen, inulin, right? So, um, f uh, a form of fiber, um, erythritol, malitol, these are all sugar alcohols, okay? Um, mannitol, xylitol. So these are things that are used to sweeten stuff without having any caloric content, right? Or very low caloric content. 
we track a, a huge amount of these um, saccharides, right? So again, sugars, um, sorbitol, raffinose, all the different resistant starches. We track available carbohydrates without, with su- without sugar alcohols and available carbohydrates with sugar alcohols, acetic acid, citric acid, um, fumaric acid, lactic acid, malic acid. So all of these different types, oxa- oxalic acid, propionic acid, you know, like all of these different, um, acids. We track the amount of aluminium, um, arsenic, cadmium, uh, calcium, chromium, chloride, cobalt, copper, fluoride, iodine, iron. So we're tracking in this Australian database that it tracks all of the essentials. Okay. That's, that's essentially what I'm trying to get. I'm going to, I'm going to summarize it because it's getting boring, but we've got Magnesium, manganese, mercury, molybdenum, nickel, phosphorus, potassium, selenium, sodium, sulfur, tin, zinc, vitamin A, uh, alpha carotene, beta carotene. These are your um, vitamin E's, okay? Um, a whole bunch of, of, of uh, vitamin A equivalents. You've got all of your B vitamins, right? All the B vitamins. Your al- oh, sorry, alpha tocopherols are your... Um, vitamin E's. Sorry. Yeah. Not your beta carotene. Your beta carotenes are your vitamin A's. Um, Delta tocopherols, gamma tocopherols, these are all your, your, um, vitamin E kinds. We track all of these different fatty acids, right? So these are all fatty acids. Those names aren't familiar to most people. Um, these are, this is indicating the, the chemical bond structure for the, the carbons in these fatty acids. But this is a variety of different fatty acids. Omega-3s are in there, et cetera. Um, and then we do, in Australia, we do caffeine as well. So we track caffeine in food, cholesterol. Then we track the amino acids. So we have all of the amino acids here. Uh, yeah, alanine, arginine, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, glycine, all of those things, um, proline, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we track, in Australia, they track all of the essential nutrition from calories, macros, to essential amino acids, essential fatty acids, vitamins, macro minerals, and micro minerals, and then some, right? We track even the ones that aren't essential. So it's very comprehensive is my point, right? Now, if we come down to the USDA, right, they also track the calories, the protein, carbohydrates, the sugars, the fiber, the fat, total fatty acids from saturated, mono, poly, right? So you can, you can track those. Cool. Cholesterol, retinol, uh, vitamin A, they do the carot- uh, carotenes, they do um, lutein, the thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, vitamin B6, folic acid, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So they've got a good chunk of the B vitamins, right? Um, I think all of them except for B5, if I'm not mistaken. I think B5 is missing. They track vitamin C, D, E, E, and K, right? So that's the the fat solubles. Perfect. Fantastic. They track calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, iron, zinc, copper, selenium, potassium, sodium, caffeine, theobromine, and alcohol. So there are a few of those essential um, minerals that are missing. Okay. They track a decent percentage of the fatty acids, but we're missing things on here, um, such as, oh, where did they go? Yeah, it looked like the um, the list from Australia was much more comprehensive. Comprehensive? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So there are essentially um, all of the essential amino, like all of the essential amino acids aren't being tracked. Mm, that's, right? that's really interesting. So it, it's it's hard to get a fine grain understanding based off of that data set of what essential, um, amino acids you are or are not ingesting. Um, it's, it's not like a, ma- a major issue because we do have that food data from other data sets from different places and they yeah. will be somewhat similar. It won't be obviously exactly the same, but it will be somewhat similar. So you can sort of infer it to some degree, but I just found it interesting that the the data that they collect isn't isn't comprehensive of all the essentials 
So, right? Like you would think that would just be like your bare minimum. Like wouldn't you just sort of start with the essentials and, you then, and then build the rest out kind of vibe? Yeah, you would think. Are they just, I'm wondering how expensive it is to do some of these test testings. Maybe yeah. it's like a... It's, like a it, it would be expensive for sure, but like they're already doing it. You know what I mean? Like why, why wouldn't you? And other places can do this. So how how is that? You know, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is weird. Uh, I'm mad curious as to why. Maybe they thought it's just not needed. I don't know. There might be a conspiracy here. Well, there's no Molly Bendham. There's, yeah, like I said, there's none of the um, essential amino acids on here. Yeah. It just, it's very strange. That is strange. Hmm. I'm wondering if there's like a commonality between the ones that are missing. You know what I mean? Like, did they not hit a certain requirement for some reason? The, the quantity is so low that it just wasn't worth, it's not worth observing. Recording? Recording. That's an interesting point. Or um, it's just the percentage of people with the deficiency in certain of these new of these nutrients just hasn't occurred in such a long time that it just became, well, maybe there is really no point in investigating these further because we have no cases of people who are deficient in these, you know, whatever nutrients that they decided to leave out. Um, regardless though, even regardless though, even if that was the case, there still needs to be, there still needs to be data for that. It's just interesting because nutrition is such a highly investigated field. I feel like it's really, I feel like it's not, maybe not oversaturated, but it is very saturated with, with information at, at times. And so I would have never thought that there would have been nutrients that weren't further studied. It's interesting because some of these nutrients could have a lot of benefits if they were studied further, right? There yeah. could be benefits that we don't even know of that we, we would never even consider just because we don't have the, uh, that data. We've never done those, uh, investigations. Well, so yeah, um, in, that might just be the USDA, right? So outside of that, like other, other places are looking into this and there is, right, we've right, got a, right. we've got a really big, uh, or we've got a very large amount of data on, on these things. There is, um, very comprehensive, um, information booklets or, you know, like it comes in the form of research papers of like trying to be the comprehensive guide to like all of the things that vitamin C does in the human body. Um, yeah, there's like comprehensive, um, guides on like all the side effects of overconsumption or underconsumption, right? So there's, it's very comprehensive. Like that's, I, I've been going over them the last few weeks, compiling them into a big database so that we can do some large scale statistics on that. So we can sort of, again, put together a map of like, what roles do these play? Um, it's incredibly complex. Like there's so much going on. Um, but we definitely have a, more than enough, we definitely have enough data, uh, information and knowledge about these things to really start to, to put it together and make more sense of it. Again, it's just, yeah, again, super odd that they, they don't track some of these essentials. Like if you're already doing all of that, other places are already doing it. Makes sense. Like, yeah. Why is that not readily available? Um, because what it really does by not having it readily available, it makes it very difficult for anyone to make an informed decision, um, about their nutrition, right? Like it, it just True. makes it harder than it otherwise needs to be. Um, so yeah, it, it just bonkers, man. Like it, it baffles me. Um, I'm just going to not screen share for a second. I'm going to get okay. one thing. I'll... It's interesting because the, maybe not so much anymore, but probably social media would be a greater driving force now than than like your typical media outlets in terms of what is being studied. Because for example, Omega-3 was like this huge, there was this huge push for Omega-3 and there still kind of is, but I don't remember how many years ago this was now, but it was like this, it was just like a boom. And because of that, you would have many people becoming interested in studying Omega-3 
And then that would just drive the amount of science being conducted around omega-3, surely because more people have become interested in that because it became popular. It was like a, like the new thing. And that, that, I don't know if that still occurs. I just haven't been in the game for a while. Um, but what's something recent that you found that's been being pushed a lot? Because there always seems to be something goes in, a, like comes in style and something goes out of style. And I remember Omega 3 was like something that was in style for, for a while. Yeah, I would argue it still is. It's so important. Um, it's, it's, it's huge for um, brain function, brain health, cellular health. Um, nervous system health, um, it can help with inflammation. We can thin the blood, help with blood flow, like, um, capillary health, blood vessels. Yeah. You know, like it's just so much. It's, it is super important. Again, yeah. the sources of, of where you get it from, it really matters. So like your average sort of omega-3 supplement probably isn't going to be cutting it. Um, and so it's important to get it from, for, I think from food sources, two of my, or three of my favorite food sources for Actually, I'm going to do four. Four of my favorite food sources for omega-3 is um, grass-fed meat. I love that. Um, it's, yeah, fucking delicious. Um, second favorite food source would be uh, smoked cod liver. I freaking love smoked cod liver. It is just heavenly delicious. Uh, and then you've got like um, wild-caught salmon. And it doesn't need to always be the fresh kind. You can go for the tin stuff. Um can have fantastic levels of, of vitamin C, uh, but omega-3, sorry. And, um, sardines, I'm mad like wild caught sardines, um, specifically the Portuguese style. Um, they taste more like tuna to me. Um, yeah. and I, I just love them and I, I, I get those, uh, all in olive oil and they're delicious. Like that, I, that was, I had that for breakfast this morning. I had, um, two tins, two tins of sardines mashed up with some some parsley, some lemon juice, some salt, and some uh, extra olive oil drizzled over the top um, with eggs. And um, that's, I love that. That's a great breakfast for me. Nice, guy. Yeah. Again, when you first start eating them, you're like, meh, meh, meh. But like, I don't just eat for flavor. I eat yeah. for function as well. Like I want yeah. to eat foods that nourish me. And if I know that something has certain um, nutrients that, that are going to help me to thrive and help me to be... Yeah, the be best version of myself. Um, I'll deliberately try and include those into my diet, um, and I'll, I'll, in the short term, overlook the fact that they might not be as delicious as eating, you know, bacon and eggs or something like that. Um, for the long term benefit of being able to nourish my body. When you go to the supermarket, how do you buy cod liver? Like they just sell that individually. Uh, okay. So it's not that easy to get it, Like, it's not like you don't just go into a supermarket and they'll be like, there's, there's smoked cod liver on the shelves. Um, we buy it from like a Italian provador and, um, I don't, they might, they buy it from an importer obviously, but it comes in like a, a little tin. Yeah. And in each tin, there's 13 milligrams of omega threes. Oh, oh, nice. Yeah. So I'll typically do a tin for breakfast, <laughs> which is a bit overkill, but there's, um, some residual cod liver oil that like, you, you don't always eat all the cod liver oil cause it's quite cod liver oily, but then you can just have that, um, you know, throughout the day or the next day or something along those lines. But, um, smoked cod liver oil, that's the oil, but you can also just actually, what I'm talking about here is not just smoked cod liver oil. It's actually smoked cod livers. Right. And then you just spread it on bread or something, right? You said? Man, honestly, on toast, it is the foie gras of the ocean. Yeah. It is the most delicious thing. Oh, it's so good. Cod liver. I'm going to try and find that if I can, if I can buy that here. Smoked even, cod liver. Because you've been talking about it for a while and, and I've been thinking about looking into it more. I don't know if I can get it here, but you can buy it on Amazon. Yeah, trying to order it, dude. It is the it is so good. Like I'm such I love that stuff. It is delicious and incredibly nutrient dense, right? It is packed with uh, mad nutrition. Um, so I just I quickly while I wasn't paying as much attention, you asked me a question. I don't think I directly answered your question. You asked me about hype stuff, and I went off on an omega three tangent. No, no, I was just it's just something that came to mind. It was just a comment I was making. I didn't have a question actually. It was just something I thought it was interesting. Something that I've observed 
when I was, especially when I was studying nutrition, the hype shit is what would be getting studied. So if something is not being hyped up, it's not, there's not going to be a lot of funding or interest in yeah. investigating that further. So, you know, when the hype train starts, that's what's, that's what's being pushed. That's what's getting investigated. That's where the money's at. So nutrition sort of leans into what is popular based on, on hype. So it's not yeah. necessarily based on, you know, let's try and optimize health. It's no, let's try and jump on the money train. So that's where, that's sort of the direction where a lot of the investigation goes most of the time. Do you follow Sabine Hussenfelder? No. She's a physicist, has a YouTube channel. She's kind of, she's actually quite funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, she, she's like an academic was in like the quantum, um, quantum theory, quantum experiment side of things, like trying to get to the bottom of physics stuff. And, uh, she just did a, a, a YouTube video, I think it's like seven or eight minutes long about, uh, academia and science, how it's, and it's not actually about trying to develop new knowledge and build knowledge. It's actually about making money. <laughs> And it's, she just, like her video essentially does like a very good explanation of the exact thing that you were just talking about. Uh, it's not really about trying to, you know, improve knowledge or gain further knowledge. It's actually about, yeah, how can we make money and make the most of it? Um, we have a friend that works in, in the industry, uh, who is well versed in this. Thing. He's the, <laughs> he's the little grant writer, you know, he's got to, he's got to keep trying to bring that money in for the, for the university, you know, um, and it's a pain, it, like, it's horrible. It, it, it distracts from the whole thing. Um, so quickly, uh, I just put those lists that I had into chat GPT and I asked it to tell me what's missing from here. Um, so what's missing. So vitamins missing from the USDA list. Um, so there's some specific types of essential fatty acids are not detailed beyond just omega-3 alpha linoleic acid and omega-6 linoleic acid, specific omega-3 fatty acids like um, EPA, DHA, et cetera. Um, vitamins missing from the USDA list. The USDA list is comp comprehens comprehensively covers fat-soluble, water-soluble vitamins, including the subsystems, blah, 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 blah. Minerals missing from the USDA list. There is chloride and cobalt missing from that USDA list. And then there is, I think there's molybdenum as well, but... Um, the essential uh, amino acids. So histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, threonine, tryptophan, and valine are all missing from that. So they're not tracked. Weird. Yeah. Weird. A lot of amino acids for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, that's essentially all the amino acids are missing. And uh, molybdenum isn't listed on there uh, and a bunch of others. But chat GPT is hella biased. Like it didn't even pick that up. Dick. <laughs> it's too woke that's why it is it's, it's very woke um so yeah uh, interesting right like you would think that like if these things are essential for humans to function well right it's essentially like that's the basis for health do you know what i mean like if you're deficient in some of those things you can't by definition you you can't be functionally functioning um Completely, right? Like not all of your processes can be completing uh, as effectively as they could otherwise be if they had that minimum level of nutrition, right? So it just, again, we kind of understand why, but it, it is still baffling as to why this isn't talked about more. Why is, aren't people educated about these things at a young age? Like why are we not taught in primary school about essential nutrients? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, it's an excellent question. I remember like the vitamin C thing for sure. Um, but beyond that, like what else was discussed? You know, like it, it's just, it's crazy. There are essential amino acids, um, you know, that you need to have to, to build structures, to complete processes in your body. Why aren't they discussed more? Why aren't we taught about the, 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 the food sources that are rich in these things or that can provide them to us? It is crazy to think about because we literally, that's what we, that's how we survive. Like you gotta, you gotta, you know what I mean? Like we're eating every uh -huh. day, something we're yep. doing, interacting with every single day, every couple of hours. So it is interesting that 
we're not taught those things from a young age. It's weird. Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. So this is, um, I want this to exist, right? Like I've wanted this for quite a long time. I want to just be able to say like, okay, um, I am, like, yeah, I'm, on me, I'm a certain you know, height, weight, activity level, all those different things. Um, I'm going to have certain requirements. I want to, I want to have my nutrition so that it can meet all of those things. It's very tedious to go through and try and do this on your own and find all these different meals. Like I've been able to do it to some degree, but it should be easy. Um, that's one of my goals with this and with good meals is to be able to do that just to like, what's an example of a meal plan that provides like the, the bare minimum for the average person. All right, what does that kind of look like? And it, it won't just be one, there won't just be one you know, meal plan. Like there can be many versions of it that'll all, all get you those, those minimum levels. Um, what do they look like? Can, and I also want like the ability to be able to type in, like, so if I'm being doing heaps of stressful stuff and I'm being out sweating, whatever, and I, uh, you know, I've sweated out a bunch of my, um, potassium and, uh, and I'm, de- I've depleted my magnesium levels or whatever. And I want a, a meal that's rich in potassium, magnesium and, and certain ami- and essential amino acids, right? I, c- I should be able to just describe, like say that, like I want, I want this, I want a meal that's rich in this, these nu- this nutrition. Okay. And then it should be able to go and construct a meal based on all of that information and coming pull the soon. foods from the database. Exactly. That is coming, coming soon. soon. Um, it, it, is, yeah. it is currently under development. Um, Hell yeah. But yeah, it, like I, I just imagine what the world would be like. like it, it really is an interesting thought experiment to think about. Like, okay, if nine out of 10 people in the US are deficient in potassium, 50% of them are deficient in magnesium. Like what does the world look like when, you know, a large percentage of the world's population is actually nourished. Like what happens to productivity? What happens yeah. to healthcare? What happens to yeah. like quality of life? What happens to, what happens to the health of the planet? Like, what happens to the genetics, right? Because exactly. epige- epigenetics is a thing. Like imagine you have generations and generations who are deficient in potassium, deficient in magnesium, deficient in, what was the other ones? Oh, um, calcium, right? Like very yeah. important nutrients. Vitamin what? D is going to be a big one. Do they have a stat on vitamin D? No, but that's another, uh, I didn't read that one, but that's, that's another huge. one that's, it's huge. Yeah. That was not mentioned in that, in that post, but you're right. Vitamin D is another one that's largely yeah. deficient. Big time in depression too. So like in, um, in, in Britain, uh, in the UK, they have a thing called SAD, S-A-D, seasonally affected disorder right? When there's just not the same levels of sunshine out, uh, people get depressed, right? So, you know, how much of, of depression is actually, you know, like, uh, a chemical, you know, like, uh, not chemical imbalance, but like how much of it is depression and, and, and not just a lack of sunshine, like how, and, and again, on top of that, like how much of it is, um, depression versus like, uh, not pursuing you, your passions and goals and how much of not pursuing your passions and goals is related to nutrient deficiency, right? Like there's so, it's so intertwined with all of these things. Like just like, yeah, what would the world look like if, if more people were nourished? Mm. I'm going to, we're going to make that world a uh, reality, by the way. Yeah. Uh, and so we'll be able to answer that question so yeah. at, some t- at some point Hell in the future. Yeah. But yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about, eh? It is really interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Nobody... Not sorry, not nobody, but it, it just seems it, it's too. I don't know. I don't know how to. I don't know how to say it. Like ninety percent of Americans are deficient in potassium, but I don't. I think like ninety percent of that ninety percent, they don't give a fuck. They, wouldn't they don't know fuck. to. They don't know to. Right? But like, I'm we're, saying, we're, if you told them, I don't think they would even give a fuck. Most people, for some reason, they they don't seem to care. Yeah, and um, I I would argue a good percentage of that is because it's not sort of it isn't part of education. It isn't like uh, a lot of people. It's that growth mindset versus fixed mindset kind of vibe, right? Yeah. Like if you have a growth mindset, you, you sort of acknowledge that you can improve and become more than you currently are. If you have a fixed mindset, you just think this is how it is and this is how it's always going to be. I think that's why like a lot of people don't care because they, they, they don't think they can control any of this. They don't think they can change anything. They don't think they can change how they feel, how they look, 
You know, like this is the argument with the, the obesity, like obesity is a genetic thing. Please. <laughs> it's epigenetic. Like, let's be real here. Okay. Um, it really matters what you do with your body, what you put into your body. Like that's going to drive it more than anything. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. So I just think a lot of people have sort of painted themselves into a corner where they feel helpless. They don't feel as if they have any control or agency over these things, which is essentially ends up presenting as they don't care. Yeah, but that's a good point. If, if they could, and if they realize that they, they actually do have a huge amount of control over how they feel, what they do, their energy levels, their mental health, their outcomes in life, et cetera, et cetera, um, that I think it, it, would, it would be more appealing to people. But I also think that there's an interesting way to sort of hack that and get around it, which is like, um, if people around you are starting to do things differently and starting to get outcomes that you would, might want, then that sort of pulls you to do it, right? So this is this kind of like, if you want to get better, hang around people that are better than you at that thing, right? And you will trend up towards them as opposed to trending down. If you, if you want to get worse at something, hang around with people that are they're really bad at doing these things and, 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 and participating in negative behaviors and you'll trend down, right? Um, so as, if, as, as we can get more people educated or at least, right, this is another thing like, so shortcut the, the education aspect, don't even educate, right? Um, just make it incredibly easy for people to ingest meals that are nourishing, right? And delicious, right? So then they, they, don't, they don't need to really necessarily think that they're ingesting all this new extra nutrition that you've just solved the problem for them, which is like making, um, making getting nutritious food easier. Okay. So this can happen via like actually getting the recipes to make nutritious food or, uh, having technology that can, you know, like Uber Eats, right. But instead of having Uber Eats for all the shitty junk food, you have a Uber Eats that is nourishing. So like the foods on that platform are actually nutrient dense. They nourish people. So that then when people are ordering these foods, they're actually getting that nutrition. And then all of a sudden they're, they're not even conscious that that's happening, but they just start to feel better, perform better, et cetera. So I think there are ways around it, but I think that, that pulling people up is, is the strategy, right? So as more and more people, there is a percentage of the population who are into this, who are, who do care about this. And as they start to do it, they start to see the performance improvements that people around them start to see, oh my God, like, what have you been doing? Like, you're just able to do all this cool stuff or you're thriving or you, you look so young or whatever. Um, and then they, then that gets people curious. And then so more of those people do it than the people around them, they start to get curious and can have this flow on effect. That's true. Good point. Yeah. Power of technology. But I think the, the simplest way is to just make it easy and make it sort of, like you mentioned, not like they don't even need to be conscious about it. it just, it's just a consequence of, of, of using a technology or, or ordering a food that way. Um, but yeah. Unless you got anything to finish with, Guy, I think that's a wrap. Yeah, I just wanted to say if anyone out there wants to do a deeper dive into this possible conspiracy that's going on, all you got to do is you got to map out which nutrients are being left out of the database and then do a deep dive into each nutrient. There's possibly a link between these nutrients. You have to look at the different pathways and you have to look, or sorry, you have to look at the different things in which these nutrients do for the body right? Look at the different pathways and start connecting the dots because there might be a link between all these and there might be a conspiracy, which um, could have something to do with diminishing our health. I'm going to send you this chat that has a list of them and you can put it in the show notes. All right. All right. It, it would just be interesting because there, there, there possibly could be a, uh, an answer for this. There could be a reason. There could be a link between these nutrients. You ever know. Yeah. Ever know, guy. I agree. It's an interesting thing to look at for sure. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Anyone that listened, uh, <laughs> guy, that was fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, I learned Hell a little yeah. bit. I think you learned a little bit. Uh, and yes, keep stay tuned for the map. Um, it's going to be an interesting tool. Um, but yeah, peace out guy. Uh, have a mad night and love. Love you, bro. Peace. Love you too, guy. Bye. Later.